Hello, this is Al Black with another episode of Chewing the Gristle. And my co-host and friend, the poet, Tim Conroy. Hello, Tim. My brother, Al. How are you doing today? I'm good. And our poet today is from West Texas Hill Country, Lucy Griffith. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you, guys. I'm so happy to be with you today. Lucy Griffith is happiest on a tractor named Mabel, a muse of 55 horsepower. Lucy Griffith lives on a ranch besides the Guadalupe River near Comfort, Texas. Her first collection of poems, We Make a Tiny Herd, was published by Main Street Rag as a finalist in their poetry book contest. Tiny Herd was recently awarded the Wrangler Prize for poetry by the Cowboy Hall of Fame, as well as the 2020 Willa Literary Award for Poetry. She was the returning contributor scholar in poetry for the 2019 Breadloaf Writers Conference. In addition, she has been nominated three times for a pushcart prize. We're happy to have Lucy. And Lucy, can you first talk to us about the origins and the beginning of your poetry journey and who inspired it at, there at the very roots uh, of, of this journey? Well, in a way, it started with two things that aren't poetry, but are poetry. I come from a long line of raconteurs. So storytelling is just a big thing in my family. Both my father and my mother and all the elders really had a way with storytelling. And the other thing is music. I, um, it's in my baby book that I only had to hear a song one time and I knew it. So I think those two things have intertwined to infuse my poetry life. Um, I was an English major and uh, I definitely wrote in college, um, but it began in earnest after I recovered from my dissertation. So it took a while to get back, you know, that voice, and I've been writing pretty hard every, ever since. Wonderful. Tim. You know, it, I'm going to ask you first, just because we have to mark this time period of our lives. How has the pandemic affected your writing? Well, it's a little crazy, but it's really uh, given it a lot of drive. I think, you know, there's very few distractions. We've got ranch work and things to tend to around here. But besides that, the other thing left to do is write. And I have found it uh, quite the refuge uh, for me, surprisingly. Um, I have a routine and um, I've wound up a few projects and I don't know, that's where my sense of helplessness about things I can't control. What I can't control is my, my, my black wing pencil to paper. Well, you know, I love to hear stories about how writers do their formal writing practice. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, when you go to that writing table, the rituals around it, you know, do you go for a walk first, you know, do you write with a, a pencil or a pen, do you write with a, in a journal, do you do word processing, um, do you howl at the moon, what, <laughs> what does Lucy do? Well, um, most of the generation of ideas comes on my th three times a week runs, and um, there's something about that, either walking or running, that really seems to get my motor going. And then my husband's really good at wordplay. So we play with words a lot all day long. And I just write that if, if one of the things we come up with or he comes up with hits me, I write it down immediately. 
Like one day he said, you ought to write a poem called Uh-Ode. And that, and that happened. I wrote it down in my, on my phone and it turned into a poem about all the mistakes I've made. So uh, it's fun to be with someone who uh, loves words as much as I do. So once I get my idea, I take some, I have my notes, I get my black wing pencil and my little notebook. And then I put on a headset and I listen to bilateral music, which is comes from the trauma treatment world where the music is going back and forth in your head, in your, and after about five minutes, I don't hear the music, but everything is flowing. The, the guy who taught me brain spotting when I was doing therapy and for trauma victims, he just offhandedly said, oh, and if you're doing anything creative, listen to that music, it really helps. Oh, it really helps. I mean, I get these wild ideas and it seems to like open up. Usually if I have a lot of juice around an idea, it's because there's something in my unconscious, I think that is ready to come out, but I have no idea what it's gonna be. And there, and there's the surprise or the turn. Um, it's really been a fun thing. That system is working really well for me. So you, you're trying to activate both your right brain and left brain. Right. Um, and describe the music again, what, you know. It's, I, called, bi it's called bilateral music. And you can, it's on YouTube and you can, and just listen to it really sometimes it's nature sounds but the main thing is that it go from one ear to the next and back and forth that's that's, that's great that's a wonderful tip i really recommend it and i have friends i have a friend who's writing a screenplay and you can listen to the same thing over and over it's it still works well de describe your poetry style a bit well i you know, coming from the a line of storytellers, a lot of my poems are narrative. Um, I think, I hope what I do that's a little bit different is beneath the story, there are layers of meaning. So it can work on a metaphorical way. It can work on a, you know, intra-psychic exploration. Um, I like them to have a lot of layers. And you can just take it as a story or you can go deeper, I hope, if that works for you. Well, you, you did that. Well, you did the stories, right? These sort of almost connected a little bit, these stories in We Make a Tiny Herd. Can you talk about the cohesion of that collection and how that came together? Well, I was fascinated with this woman that we would see when we would go out to West Texas beside, you know, on her burrow beside the road. And I, uh, after I decided to write, uh, it was an assignment to write a persona poem. And I thought I'd, I'd like to get inside her head and she was already gone by then, but it wasn't very hard to imagine uh, as a horsewoman myself and, and loving that country out there. It wasn't too hard to imagine this woman and what her inner life might be. So I wrote that, I started that. And then um, one of my mentors is a poet, former poet laureate of Texas, Larry Thomas. And he said, keep writing. I think there's more here. So I just would write anything that occurred to me about her, sometimes from her point of view, sometimes from the Burroughs point of view. I gathered some stories over about three years about her, which it was hard to gather much about her because she was so quiet. And so then that's how, then I had this mishmash, but they did end up separating into the borough lady speaks, the borough speaks, I speak, the stories speak, and then the eulogies for her after she had passed. Well, how about reading a, uh, maybe two poems um, now so our listeners can hear them? Okay. This is in the voice of the Burrow lady or her name was Judy Majors. 
and the whole book of poems is to honor her. Lorena, I take no charity. I am not homeless. My hat makes a fine roof. My blankets are my floor, striped and stacked. My solace, the smell of creosote. My journey follows the bar ditch, my rhythm, the flop of my burro's ears, my music, the clop of his hooves. And I'm proud to ride tall boots and spurs, part of me. No tent, no fire. And I don't want to talk for I am full of thousands of sunsets and brimming with stars. In a quiet so still, I hear my heartbeat. I have my secrets, not lonely, just alone. I answer to my burro and myself, I am La Reina, queen of my own life. From you, I only ask respect. Do not lay your story over mine. That's beautiful. I love that point. Thank you. Wonderful. How about another? This is um, this is all true. So it, it's the at the end of her life. Valediction. From Arizona, California, and both Dakotas, they come for your goodbye. Two sons, three daughters, found. Tributaries joining the river of respect pooled in this tiny desert town named for a three-tongued creek. Your children arrive just as you do, carry your simple coffin into St. Agnes. They know where you are now. An Indian blanket drapes the wood, candles, a few photographs, flowers from strangers. No pews, the blue and yellow walls are polished with sun. Ashen gray clouds have caught a ride to Mexico on the sleigh of the wind, burnishing the sky with indigo. It is time, no wind now, all is still on Boot Hill. The five carry your coffin at your familiar processional pace through the creosote scrub to your place with a view of Mueller Peaks. Next in the cortege, a spotted burro wreathed in flowers, riderless but saddled, boots backwards in the stirrups, a royal farewell to La Reina Scores file behind. Are you surprised? All those who didn't know you, but loved the idea of you, honored your secrets? It is February. The blue bonnets will be up soon, nodding their azure heads in the bar ditch, looking for you. I love that. It's just <laughs> remarkable. Thank um, you. The boots backwards. Oh. <laughs> Brother Al. Yeah, I, I really like uh, the whole narrative way in which you tell your poems. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of difference of opinions on this subject, but talk to you, us about your method. How much revision do you do? And is a poem ever really finished? <laughs> uh, the more I learn, the more I revise. You know, I, I like to think I'm getting better. And I certainly study. I read good poems when I wake up and I read good poems before I go to sleep. I hope it's getting in there. And I take every craft class I can. Um, Sometimes I, I, my fellow writers and I, we call it bishoping. There'll be a, a poem and only a small piece of it will really need to survive. Um, but 
um, and then it, it just becomes its own other thing, you know, as if Elizabeth Bishop turned it from point A to point D. But I read out loud a lot, and if it if I stumble, there's a problem. And I, I've read out loud enough that I can read in my head and know it's really important to me that a poem have music. I really like the sounds to uh, do their magic. And if a poem doesn't have music, I usually don't like it. <laughs> so yeah, I just keep right, revising until it doesn't seem like there's anything that doesn't belong. And hopefully it has a surprise for the reader. That's wonderful. Now, talk to me about who, what poets are you reading now? And, and who is fueling or what is fueling your imagination? Well, let's see. Um, my heroes are, you know, after Frost and Whitman in childhood, my heroes as an adult are uh, Maxine Kuhlman and Stanley Kuntz. He, both of them have beautiful sound in their poems and then they talk about things a lot in nature, you know, with animals and horses and all of that, uh, gar the garden. Yeah, I find the fact that there's not a single word that seems misplaced inspiring from those two. Um, currently, I really am enjoying Ada Limon because she writes about childbearing loss in a way that I think is really compelling. Um, so who else? Rita Dove, you know, I have her, all of her things. She can do no wrong. Again, she writes about the, the ordinary in an extraordinary way. So I find that inspiring. Okay. Um, share with us a couple more poems, if you would. Okay. Well, my next project has been about a ranch in South Texas that I grew up on. Um, that was really rough. South Texas is the brush country. It's like a wall of thistles and thorns. So, uh, and my experiences there, I think really formed me in some important ways. So uh, here's one from this collection I'm calling Thorn and Fang. Hung out to dry. Behold the flycatchers, elegant, peachy scissor tails, flashy vermilions. Behold the border hosting the gaudy green jay, the slow waddle of Inca doves. Home to 30 pound diamondbacks, bobcats, badgers, cotamundi, gila monsters, horn toads, but the bugs, massive ants, the color of rubies, rhinoceros beetles that loom. We watch a dung beetle like a man pushing a bus, roll a ball of manure for hours, straight and steady across the yard. Until an epic dry spell, year after year, no real moisture, then a rain bomb blows the lid off our gritty world. After an all night storm, serenades on tin, I wake to a dark porch. Sun's up, still dark. I pull on boots from the pile near the door, step outside real slow. Our porch screens carpeted with spiders, tarantulas from gutter to ground, hundreds and hundreds blocking the light. They are waving. Each creature stretches a hairy black leg into the breeze, one by one, to dry. It's a great ending, Lucy. I love that. Thank you. Let's dig into your craft a little bit. Okay. Um, 
what are the poetic elements you tend to rely on and what do you avoid? Well, of course, um, sound and wordplay are really important. Um, I've really been trying to learn more and practice more the idea of an extended metaphor, something that's kind of underneath. It's not particularly spelled out as a, um, a simile. Um, what else? I like imagery that you can touch, taste, or feel. I really like, you know, if it doesn't grab you, I don't, I don't put it in there. Um, so those would be the primary things, I think. Do you use rhyme any? Do you, do you stay away from rhyme? Do you do slant rhyme or, what, you know, sort of talk about? If I do, if I do rhyme, I tends to be, unless I'm following a form, which I really recommend for training, um, unless I'm following a form, I, I'm acutely aware of using rhyme uh, if it adds. So, and, but it, what I find usually happens is it's internal rhyme or slant rhyme. How, how do you approach your line breaks in, in, in your openings of poems and your endings of poems? Do you have a certain um, approach to that or is it just by feel or what, what does Lucy do? <laughs> I, it, it depends on what the poem wants to be. Um, so if I, I want the poem to have some surprise, I put a line break where I want the reader to go, huh? You know, shake the reader up a little bit, like an unexpected place to end a line. Um, sometimes I count syllables if I want it to be um, a methodical. Um, yeah. So I try not to have a line that's longer than a breath. So that's, you know, about nine to 11 syllables. Uh, that's, I love that tip. You know, that's a, <laughs> that's a great thing to think about. And I love the pace of how you read your poems. Thank Do you God. read your poems out loud, you know, before you finish them? Are you reading them out loud along the way? All along the way. Yeah, my poor husband has to hear them, hear the crappy first versions, but he's really patient. <laughs> well, do you have a writing group that you um, work with? Are you part of a group? I, um, I have a dear friend in Comfort. There's quite a number of poets around Comfort, and we do have a quarterly reading when we're not having a pandemic that's been really, really fun and successful. Um, but she and I exchange poems every week. And right now we talk by phone once a week. Um, and I have an AWP mentor, and Athena Kildegard, who teaches at the University of Minnesota. She's fabulous. And, and we, we continue to meet once a week by Skype and exchange poems. Let's talk about how do you uh, get an AWP mentor? What's the process for that? Uh, they do it twice a year and you it's free and you send in a batch of poems and they match you. And she liked my stuff and it's really been a good fit. It's, really been a good fit. We even wrote a poem together about, you know, she's kind of right up, up the country for me about, you know, us being in such different parts of the world and yet so connected. We wrote a poem together. Now that's that's wonderful to have that sort of collaboration. I just can't tell you how important mentorship has been for me. You know, especially starting later in life. You know, after after several other careers, <laughs> it's been really how important wonderful. In, in your poetry. How important is the terrain of where you live? A, a lot of what I see, you know seems to hold a metaphor in it, whether it's Inca Dove sunning, you know, with every feather up, you know, 
yeah, the terrain is huge. Yeah, that's it. it it's, um, it's, you know, you, you wonder, do you, you know, I wonder, do you have many city poems? Are you, when you travel into the city, uh, is that, you know, or is that something that just doesn't happen as much because you're where you are is where you are? I don't have very many city poems. That's a good observation. I, and I, I really don't like to stay in them longer than about three days. <laughs> I'm an out, I'm a country girl now. I don't, I don't think I can go back. <laughs> no, I, I love that because, you know, it, it is, there is a, you know, us, us human beings, we have a connection to where we live. Right. And, and, you know, whether it's a, in the city or in the country, it becomes part of who you are. And as we have talked to poets um, in, in this last year, it becomes more and more evident that mm -hmm. where they're surrounded and by what they're surrounded by becomes uh, what their poems are embedded in. Right. So. Uh, oftentimes folks have resources or uh, poetry craft books or or things of that nature that they refer to or have referred to. Do you have resources or or craft sources that have helped inform your writing or maybe even still informs your writing? For sure, the two wing beats books, you know, whenever I feel a little stale, I'll pull an exercise out of there or my my writing buddy and I will do something out of wing beats. That's the, the, the two volumes edited by Scott Wiggerman, who was my first poetry teacher and David Myshen. And those exercises are just rich, rich, rich. So I still use that a lot. And for form, I really like Robert Haas's book, um, A Little Book on Form, because I'll just write free form and, and I'll go, does this want to be a sonnet? Does this, maybe there's a villanelle in here. I, there's a repetition, you know, and I go look it up and see examples. Those, those are the ones I use the most. When I dive into a form, I will try to follow it to the letter at first. Mm -hmm. And just for the discipline of it. And because I'm trying to make sure all my poems don't sound alike, because that's no fun, right? So I follow it strictly at first and then if see what it turns into. And then I may modify it or break the rules, but not always. Mm -hmm. Okay. Talk a little um, bit more about your, your next book that you're working on. Um, the, the one about the brush country? Yes. Um, it's out there looking for a home. And um, I, I think it's a unique, you know, it's a sort of, most of those are poems that only I could have written because I was an eight to 12 year old on this wild place and I spoke Spanish and the vaqueros let me into their world. So there's a lot of Spanish in it. There's a lot of um, lessons that I learned. Uh, I hope without being didactic about it. So um, I think it's a, there hasn't been a lot written about the brush country. So I hope it will find a need and then, you know, help people look back on their childhoods and pivotal events that formed them. So the psychological uh, exploration of how did I turn out like this? <laughs> Tree, um, you know, your narrative poems do not slow down. They go, they have pace. Um, and, and so often early attempts with narrative poetry and writing narrative poetry for the emerging poet, it's difficult because their poems plod a little bit too much into story. So mm -hmm. what advice can you give to the emerging poet who's interested in, to, in, in, the, um, in writing narrative poems? I would write it all out. And then I'd start stripping any, any word, any detail that doesn't make it gallop along, like you said. But mostly you're gonna miss things if you don't write at all. So yeah, 
I would write every detail you can remember and then start marking out anything, any word even, that doesn't add richness or freshness to the story. I mean, in, in, in your narrative poems, and I don't want to just categorize them as narrative poems because you write other poems too, but your narrative poems also have a lyrical quality. You know, they also have this great lyricism um, that well, sort of, you. You know, floats it along, right? And so, and they're all grounded with your, your images. Uh, your images become so important to your poems, um, which is lovely. But let's, uh, let's hear a couple like your sort of not necessarily narrative poems, but maybe towards the forms. Let's, let's hear a couple of the uh, poems you've written um, using a form. I'll share you, with you my, this was nominated for a push cart, so maybe it'll be good luck. This is a Sestina, and I did it by the book. It was, I sweat blood over this baby. So it's a golden shovel Sestina, which means that the last lines, last word of each line is from somebody else's work. And it's a title of Mary Oliver's poem called Such Singing in the Wild Branches. So those words will be used over and over again. Soaring before dawn, rags of song and light, such fine tuning, a loose, uncomposed singing. Themes warble from chaos, billow in a bowl of mourning. An invitation into the day sharpens my attention to each wild note. This dark choir behind jade branches. Disparate songs gather in the branches caroling in the daylight with such abandon, a blousy serenade of wild opinions, sorting itself to lush singing, species by species, bluebird, dove, then wren, the diva of the day, her descending aria within its pocket of sound. Daybreak's songscape in cypress, elm, and oak, a choral, tucked in branches, beckons a lingering, remembering that the harmonies must sort themselves and such solace will bloom before sun drowns the singing, before the heat of day grows wild. Stilling the bustle, I unfasten my wild thoughts, cradle a begging bowl in open hands, deliver myself to new singing, the upturned we, a goldfinch, riddles of branches and broken boughs. I ponder such accidents at what can happen to the mind unhurried, unplanned, the release of desire and even hope, that wild space in the psyche. We are such creatures of longing, so lost in our habits, our frailties like branches, hail stripped, or torn by wind. The best singing forgotten until next morning, the singing renewed again, beckoning a fresh ear to the pedalo, a cardinal clinging to the branches, sensing more secret language from the wild. Remember when trees could talk in ways we were still enough to hear? Such unquiet. As you eavesdrop on such singing, let it aim you at your day with its wild concerto of choices tucked in branches. Wonderful. And well, that should have been nominated. That's <laughs> awesome. It turned into sort of an ars poetica. This is kind of how I do my day is, you know, listen for the birds and see what I can let, let it, you know, let it teach me. So just so our listeners know, how long did you work on that poem? Pretty hard, about three weeks. How do I end a, work, end a line with such? <laughs> I want to ask you it, to say anything you want to, to the emerging poet of any age that's trying to um, find the courage and the conviction to write. Don't give up. Don't put it in front of people who don't respect it. 
particularly early on, is very tender, like a wound. So uh, really watch who you share with. Make sure they're on your team. And uh, people can get better. There's good research that people get better just by hearing what people like. They don't have to get any criticism just by knowing what other people like. I like that line. I like that word. I like that close. That's enough to really help people improve their work. So I would just be, I would treat very tenderly until you have more confidence. Because after that, there's just tons of rejection (laughs) and you have to believe in what you do. How do you deal with rejection? As soon as I get a rejection, I turn around and send it someplace else before I have time to think. And if I get more than one in a day, which has happened several times, I go down and walk on the river and let her heal me. (laughs) You know, and this is sort of the juxtaposition of that question. How do you deal with success? Um, I write it on a board so that I remember it when I get my rejections. So I have a list by, by the year of, you know, what got accepted and, Um, I try to turn the things that worked well for me. I try to, uh, give away, help other, you know, help other poets, help other people with their creative lives. Lucy, how can people get a hold of your book? Uh, they can go either to my website or to Main Street Rag in the bookstore and go to uh, We Make a Tiny Herd. It, since it's a W, it's at the very end of the bookstore, but it's there and they will send it to you. Well, can you read two last poems for us, please? That'd be great. Now, this is a true story about, um, in Big Ben, it just got 24 inches of snow, by the way. There's this place that you go up into the basin of Big Bend, and it's a very steep climb. This is called Something Hard with an epigram from Walter Prescott Webb, who said it's the finest example of earth wreckage in Texas. Distant cycling's new to me, but I am primed by October light. Crisp shadows march up layered lavas, and so I follow. Big Ben's Chisos Basin, a six mile climb from the desert floor into a ring of mountains, a dental mold of granite teeth, so steep cars stutter and stall. Says my love, I'm not sure why, but you need to do something hard. Begin among lechuguilla spikes and chino grass, up, up, ocotillos, Wave me on, up, up, I catch a cadence, hear live cry of ravens, stroke on through creosote shrub, gaudy madrone, the bear crossing sign puts fire in my legs. Halfway up, he waits, offers sports drink, Matheny pouring from the door of the van, the truth will always be, transfers its rhythm and triumph, my legs now steady, sweat, sweat nips my eyes through the smell of pinion, then switch back after switch back, slows me to a crawl, but just push, one, two, one, two, lean forward, rock me up the rock. He meets me at the crest, waving a wind jacket, woo-hooing, but no, I am screaming my victory. Fist to the heavens as I slip over the lip to slide down to the basin. No longer the woman who started the climb. That's that's glorious. This is um, sort of a poem from me to the Burrow Lady. Voice. Whenever I tell the tale of you, I sense a change in me. I hear myself speak slower, firmer, louder. Confidence blooms in my chest for I want others to know you at last, to remember you. I want to keep you alive. My shy side, the crushed part, 
steps aside to share your startling story. You, who rarely spoke, have taken my muffled voice and made it boom. Boom. That was a great <laughs> boom. We're reaching the end of this, but I would like to ask you one question. You mentioned that you came to poetry later in life. Both Tim and I resisted poetry uh, and didn't become published poets until later in our life as well. When did you become, you know, to the point that you became a poet? As you said, you had a number of careers. Um, it, like it was after the dissertation, <laughs> about a year after. I just missed um, being creative with my words. And, you know, they pretty much strip every, every shred of uh, <laughs> anything creative from a dissertation. So I tried and it got dropped. So it took me a year to lick my wounds. And um, then I started writing. It's like, I, it has, it's like it fell into a place I didn't know was empty. Poetry for me a little bit later in life. Well, this has been a wonderful time uh, with, with a wonderful poet from an area of the world that I, I didn't grow up in. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, you know, as a kid, I always thought, oh, I want to, I want to be a, a cowboy and ride these, these uh, uh, dry areas. But in listening to your poetry, they weren't dry. <laughs> Him and I want to thank you for sharing your poetry and your experience and knowledge of poetry. Thank you, Lucy Griffith. Oh, you guys are great. I could talk poetry with you all day long. Thank you for having me. <laughs>